Hi, my name is Andrew Nevins. I'm with the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stanford University School of Medicine. And in this video, I'll be talking about fever as a clinical sign. The learning objectives for this video are to describe the mechanism of the development of fever, interpret temperature as a clinical sign, and to recall the broad differential diagnosis of fever, including fever of undetermined origin. Fever is a normal physiologic phenomenon regulated by the thermoregulatory center of the hypothalamus, which sits below the thalamus just above the brainstem. This center receives input from cold and warm thermal receptors located throughout the body and generates output responses that either conserve or dissipate body heat. As we will discuss, the variation in body temperature is controlled by the release of inflammatory cytokines in the hypothalamus. As you may know, what is considered normal body temperature is generally considered to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. In reality, there is actually a rather wide spectrum in what is considered normal, depending on a number of factors. In particular, normal temperature varies by individual and tends to follow a normal Gaussian distribution as illustrated here. In general, women tend to be around 0.2 centigrade higher than men but as you see here, this is by no means universal. Many patients will state that they are usually hotter or colder than 98.6, and there is some merit to this. Normal temperature also varies by age, with average temperatures tending to be higher in the young and lower in the elderly. In addition, temperature varies over the course of the day. Temperatures tend to be higher in the evening and lower in the morning. This is in part due to the fluctuation in the release of serum cortisol by the adrenal glands. Lastly, when evaluating temperature, the measurement method should be kept under consideration. As you can see, recorded temperature can vary by location in the body where it's taken, with the most accurate measurements usually being from the body's core, such as rectal temperatures or, in some instances, bladder temperatures. These are more commonly performed in an intensive care unit setting. In most clinical practice, in which such measurements are less feasible, recordings from the mouth or the ear are typically used. What leads the hypothalamus to up or down regulate body temperature involves a complex cascade of inflammatory cytokines. Some of these factors involve the production of exogenous pyrogens, or in other words, factors that stem from outside the body, from toxins, bacteria, and many other microbes. Many different endogenous factors, such as antigen-antibody complexes and activation of the complement system, can also stimulate the sequence, however. Any of these factors then leads to the production of endogenous pyrogens by inflammatory T-cells, including interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, and interferons. These endogenous pyrogens enter the circulation and can have a number of effects on the body. For example, endogenous pyrogens can have many effects on the up or down regulation of a number of hormones produced by glands in the endocrine system, for example, cortisol and glucagon. The body also produces an innate immune system response, which includes the development of leukocytosis, increased white blood cell adhesion, activation of B cells and natural killer cells, and proliferation of T cells. Endogenous pyrogens also enter the hypothalamus, which regulates the balance between heat retention and heat loss. Such an increase in endogenous pyrogens through inflammatory mediators, including prostaglandins and phospholipase, leads the hypothalamus to favor heat retention over heat loss. An elevation in body temperature is therefore caused by the cytokine-induced upward displacement of the set point of the hypothalamic thermoregulatory center. Now, we talked about what defines a normal temperature earlier. Something important to keep in mind is that what is considered normal or abnormal may also vary depending on the host immune status. In particular, cell-mediated immunity has impacts on pyrogen production and the host response to such pyrogens. Therefore, a lower threshold for evaluation should exist for immunosuppressed patients. So, an elevated temperature is caused by essentially anything that initiates the production of endogenous pyrogens. The detection of an elevated body temperature, what most people classically broadly define as a fever, can be due to a variety of things. Having a fever does not necessarily mean that there is an infection. 
Whenever an elevated temperature is detected, a careful history and focused physical examination are important to help determine a cause. The differential diagnosis includes not only infections, but also neoplastic processes, both solid organ and hematologic, immune-related and autoimmune disorders, such as systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, and inflammatory bowel diseases, among others, allergic reactions, anything that causes the destruction of tissues, for example, tissue infarction, inflammatory reactions in tissues and blood vessels, such as vasculitis and tumor lysis, and endocrine disorders, particularly those involving the thyroid and adrenal system. In addition, damage to the thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus or other central nervous system dysregulation can result in an altered set point and be interpreted as fever. One must always keep in mind that exogenous substances, both prescription medications as well as over-the-counter medications or other substances, including toxins and heavy metals, can lead to fever. Now, it is important to note that until the 1800s and the advent of antipyretics, fever was considered by most physicians as a potent ally in treating human disease, ridding the body of the evil humors that were thought to cause human disease. In fact, there is a body of scientific evidence that supports the concept that fever, particularly in the face of infection, serves an important defense function and actually may confer a survival advantage to the host. Fever can, in fact, serve as both a beneficial and adverse host response, depending on the clinical scenario. On the one hand, the development of fever can lead to the recruitment and function of inflammatory cells. Phagocytosis and killing by neutrophils and macrophages is enhanced at elevated temperatures. Antigen presentation, antibody production, lymphocyte proliferation, cytotoxic T cell function, and the production of cytokines are all increased at higher temperatures as well. Endogenous pyrogens also can decrease the levels of some trace metals, for example iron and zinc, that many bacteria require for growth. An elevated temperature may also more directly impair microorganisms, including effects on growth, motility, and on capsule and cell wall formation. Therefore, antimicrobial susceptibility may increase at higher temperatures. On the other hand, the host response to elevated temperature can be severe and have adverse effects on the human body, such as by causing the induction of a systemic inflammatory response and sepsis syndromes, and by increasing oxygen consumption. There also can be stress on and damage to tissues and organs, particularly the cardiovascular and neurologic systems. This can be manifested by, for example, myocardial infarction in adults and febrile seizures in children. A common clinical conundrum is the so-called fever of undetermined origin, or FUO. In contrast to an isolated temperature elevation, an FUO is defined as the presence of temperatures higher than 38.3 degrees centigrade, or 101 degrees Fahrenheit, noted on multiple occasions over at least a three-week period. In addition, to meet the definition of FUO, possible etiologies must not be evident following a reasonable diagnostic evaluation over a period of at least one week. This definition, therefore, excludes self-limited causes of fever that usually resolve spontaneously or prolonged fevers for which a diagnosis is achieved. It's important to note that an atypical presentation of a common disease is much more common than a rare or unusual disorder. It's also important to pay attention to variables that may affect the patient's ability to mount a febrile response. For example, those with congenital, acquired, or pharmacologically induced immune suppression. There should be a lower threshold for evaluation in such patients. In most cases, the diagnosis is delayed not because enough tests were done, but because the physician overlooked significant clues to the diagnosis or misinterpreted their significance. A comprehensive history is crucial to making a diagnosis. In addition to thoroughly exploring the history and time course of the patient's symptoms, some additional areas to explore include medication use, both prescribed and over-the-counter, elements of the social history, including sick contacts, travel, and other exposures, and a thorough review of systems. Any localizing symptom should be evaluated and considered potentially valuable in an FUO workup. Similarly, a thorough physical examination should be performed, including re-examination if needed, paying particular attention to those body systems for which there are referable symptoms. Each symptom and physical exam finding should be evaluated and used to guide the judicious utilization of invasive or expensive diagnostic tests. 
As we saw previously, the differential diagnosis of elevated temperature can be quite extensive. The most common etiologies for fever of undetermined origin are, in general, infections, malignancies, and autoimmune disorders. It's important to note, however, that in a substantial number of cases of fever of undetermined origin, a firm diagnosis is not able to be achieved. Fortunately, most of these patients do well clinically. In the remainder of this module, we're going to use Epstein-Barr virus as a model for demonstrating the manifestation of fever as a response to infection, and to explain, if known, the mechanisms causing clinical signs and symptoms.